There's once a young boy. His mother was feeling sick, but when they went to the cupboards, the cupboards was bare. So the mother said, young boy, why don't you go to the grocery store? You pick us up some groceries. And the boy, of course, was very excited. This was the first time that his mother had ever asked him to do something like this. And he was very excited to ride his bike down to the grocery store by himself, unsupervised. He felt the weight of responsibility of his family upon him, and it enthralled him. So his mother gave him some money. He got on his bike, and he rode down to the grocery store. He goes into the grocery store. He has his list of the things that his mother told him to get, eggs, milk, bread, the usual sorts of essentials. He goes and he goes down the aisles and he picks them all out by himself. Goes to the cash register and hands a wad of cash over to uh, the uh, cash uh, the cashier. Uh, she bags it up for him and he is so excited as he's carrying his bags out of the grocery store. In his excitement, he he trips and he falls and his groceries fall out and the eggs are broken and the uh, the milk is poured out of its jug and he is just standing over his groceries that are in front of him and he's realizing he doesn't have any more money and he's heartbroken and he's sad and he feels tears start to well up into his face at that time a stranger passes by and he sees the situation and he sees what's going on and this older gentleman he walks up and he puts his hand on the boy's shoulder and he says i'll i'll take care of you today and they go in and they pick out their groceries and they go and they and they check out, and the, the nice man pays for the groceries. And as they are walking out, the, the young boy looks up at the nice gentleman, and he says, Mr., are you Jesus? That's a simple, simple preacher story. Uh, and you know from listening to me, I don't do a lot of preacher stories, but, I, but that's a preacher story that I've heard from a time that I was little. Uh, about a young boy who has goodness thrusted upon him from an outsider, and he instantly says, wow, this person, this person must be Jesus. And on that day, I believe in this preacher story world that that boy did encounter Jesus. Maybe not physically, that older man was not physically Jesus, but that older man, because of the love and the compassion that he showed on the boy, brought love and compassion love and compassion from the Savior to the boy. And when you hear stories like that, it does bring certain questions to mind. And one of the questions I want us to consider this morning is, what does it take to see Jesus? What does it take to see Jesus? What does it take to encounter Jesus? Now, like the story, uh, we can encounter Jesus in some different ways. Other people can show us the love and compassion of Jesus. Other people can show us the forgiveness of Jesus. Other people can show us the teachings of Jesus. But if I want to encounter Jesus, what is that going to take? And there's different answers probably we could give. Uh, but whether you are someone who is seeking to become a new Christian and you've never encountered Jesus before, or you're someone who you've been a Christian for a long time, if you are seeking to encounter Jesus, what does it take to see Jesus? It's the same answer every time. The answer is faith. It's by faith that we encounter Jesus. It's by faith that we uh, see Jesus working in this world. It's going to take faith. Uh, we know that faith is... Uh, the assurance of things uh, that are not seen. Uh, that faith is something that we believe in even though we might not be able to see it or fully comprehend it. We choose to put our trust into this thing. And, and, what, and, and we're leading into this because in our series, The Good News According to Mark, uh, this morning we're going to be going through four different uh, encounters with Jesus. Four different encounters with Jesus. And we're going to see how faith plays a role in, it, in the encounters of Jesus and how faith plays a role in the comprehension of the encounters that these people have with Jesus. So we're going to be in Mark chapter 7. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and open those up to Mark chapter 7. We're going to be starting in the verses that uh, Harry read for us a moment ago. I want to remind us, though, before we get there, the things that we talked about last week. Last week, we looked at one of the many showdowns of Jesus and the Pharisees. And by the time we get to the end of this story today, we'll look at another showdown of Jesus and the Pharisees. Last week, we looked at the story of Jesus and the Pharisees, where the Pharisees were challenging Jesus and his followers about cleanliness. Uh, and again, ritual, uh, 
ritual, uh, uh, ritual purity uh, by, by accordance to Jewish traditions and customs. And, uh, and Jesus gave it back to them that, uh, that true righteousness and true cleanliness comes from the inside, comes from the heart, and ha- doesn't have to do with the external. But the main thing I want us to, to keep in mind as we're going through this, Jesus has this showdown with the Pharisees. The Pharisees challenge him on ritual purity, which is very much about what they were talking about at the time, were food and contact with Gentiles. So with that in mind, Jesus has this confrontation with the Pharisees where they are challenging him about Jewish traditions of purity. And it's interesting to me, the very next thing that Jesus chooses to do, and if you notice at the beginning of uh, what Harry read for us here in Mark chapter 7, verse 24, so he has this showdown in verse 24, and from there he arose and went away to the region of Tyre and Sidon. Uh, that, that one sentence includes something in Jesus' ministry that is singular. Jesus going to Tyre and Sidon, this is the first time and the only time, as I understand it, that Jesus leaves the traditional borders of Israel, that Jesus leaves the borders of Israel that God gave Israel in the Old Testament. Jesus leaves those borders, and he goes to Tyre, which is in modern-day Lebanon, uh, and, and he goes there. So Jesus has this showdown with the Pharisees about who he can interact with and what he can interact with. It was all about, Jesus, you, you and your followers, you cannot interact with things that are unclean or people that are unclean. He gets done with this showdown, and what does he do? He goes to one of the most unclean places he could go to according to Jewish tradition and customs. He goes to uh, these Gentile lands. Uh, so let's read together again what, what Harry read for us. Mark chapter 7, starting in verse 24. And from there he arose and went away to the region of Tyre and Sidon. And he entered a house and did not want anyone to know, yet he could not be hidden. But immediately a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit heard of him and came and fell down at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile, a Syrophoenician by birth, and she begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. So this is a story of of Jesus and the Syrophoenician woman, which, by the way, is saying Syrophoenician for some reason. That's one of my favorite words in the Bible, saying Syrophoenician. Uh, now, if you read it in Matthew's account, it's gonna, she's going to be called the Canaanite woman. Uh, but really, if, if it's the title Gentile, Syrophoenician, and Canaanite, uh, all three of those titles are appropriate, and they don't contradict one another. It'd sort of be like if you said that I was someone of European descent born in the United States of America residing in Alabama. It'd be sort of like that. All of those things are true, even though if you did, were not familiar with those terms, you might think those contradict. Anyways... Jesus interacts with this woman who is a Gentile, a Syrophoenician, a Canaanite. Even if you think about what the Canaanite people are to the Jewish people, right? To the Jewish people, the Canaanites are like the original enemy. The Canaanites are like the original people uh, that directly go against what it means to them to be uh, Jewish and in faithful relationship with God. So Jesus choosing to speak to this woman, a Gentile, a Syrophoenician, and a Canaanite, is going to be controversial. Now Jesus is in a region that is Gentile. The only people that are there that are Jewish are probably his disciples. And this is probably teaching us that Jesus, or showing us that Jesus, by going up into this region and teaching in this region, of course, it's because he has compassion, but it's also because he is instructing his disciples of how it is you are to associate and deal with people who are different from you. So Jesus goes, and in Matthew's account, this woman falls at Jesus' feet and are calls out to Jesus um, about her daughter, and the disciples say to Jesus, can you deal with it? I'm, I'm paraphrasing here. But the disciples in Matthew's account say to Jesus, can you deal with this? This woman uh, keeps bugging us about this. If you read it in Matthew's account, it's very much that she is repeatedly calling out, and the disciples are like, can you please send her away? She is, she is uh, talking too much. Can you please send her away? Okay, with that in mind. Uh, now the woman was a Gentile, a Syrophoenician by birth, and she begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. And he said to her, let the children be fed first, for it, is not, uh, for it is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. 
Now, we can read this and say this is a complicated passage. Because you can read this, and you can read this, and you can say, is Jesus calling this woman a dog? Is Jesus calling this woman a dog? Uh, and in one sense, yes. In one sense, no. All right, so to give you a clue into what Jesus is saying here, and, 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 and he says, let the children be fed first. Jesus is talking about the children. When he says, let the children be fed first, he is talking about the Jewish people. He is talking about distributing the good news of who he is to the, to the Jewish people first. All right, so let the children, let the, let the Jewish people be fed first. For it is not right to take the children's bread, and Jesus is the bread of life. Jesus is the thing that is given to the world to kill, to solve uh, the world's spiritual hunger. It is not right to take the children's bread and to throw it to the dogs. The dogs represents uh, in... In, uh, to the Jewish people, it would be very common for the Jewish people, for the nation of Israel, to call non-Jewish people dogs in a very negative connotation. Uh, that would be very normal for, uh, for, for them to say. Uh, and Jesus is leaning into that stereotype. Jesus is leaning into the stereotype that Jewish people view all Gentiles as dogs. Specifically, I don't believe he's calling this woman specifically a dog. I think he is leaning into the stereotype that the Jewish people have that the Syrophoenician woman is going to be familiar with. Uh, there's lots of attempts that commentators try to make to soften this passage. I don't think it needs to be softened. Uh, I, don't, I don't think we need to try to make Jesus' words something that they are not. But Jesus is definitely leaning into the stereotype that already exists. And he is saying this because I believe in his eternal divine wisdom and knowledge of the woman's heart. He knows what this statement is going to bring out of the woman. Jesus knows the things that he says, the kind of effect that they are going to have on the people that he is saying them to. So he says this to the woman, this very challenging statement. And probably if he said this phrase to a lot of different people, the reaction and the comment back to Jesus would be very different. But Jesus didn't say this to different people. Jesus said this to the Syrophoenician woman in a, woman in a private setting. Okay, so he says, Let the children be fed first, for it, is not, for it is not right to take the children's bread and to throw it to the dogs. The woman responds. But she answered him, Yes, Lord. Yet even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. If, if you were able to be with us during our study of Jesus' conversation with the woman at the well, uh, we did that on Sunday nights for a few months, uh, several months ago. And, and part of the conversation of Jesus and the woman at the well was this banter back and forth. And you saw wit that was going back and forth between the woman and, and Jesus. And they were speaking similarly, uh, similar to how this conversation is going, uh, where, where one party says one thing that maybe pushes against the other party, and the other party doesn't really take offense to it, but actually uses it to their advantage. Jesus does that here. Jesus says something that to many people, to many Gentiles, this statement would be offensive, but to this woman, Jesus knowing her heart, to this woman, she takes it and uses it to show her faith into who Jesus is. She says, yes, Lord. She agrees with Jesus. Yes, Lord. The people you say are children are children. The person you say is bread is bread. And the people you say are dogs are dogs. Yes, Lord. She agrees. Yes, Lord. Yet even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. She agrees with what Jesus is saying. And she says, just give me a little. She's alluding to that, that, Jesus, you are so incredible as Lord. You can do so many things. You can do all the things that you want. Just a crumble, a crumb is all I need, Jesus. In Matthew's account of this story, Jesus comments on the woman's faith because of this statement. In Mark's account, he says, And he said to her, For this statement you may go your way. The demon has left your daughter. 
And she went home and found the child lying in bed and the demon gone. You had this conversation, this, this back and forth. This woman chose not to take offense at the thing that Jesus was saying to her. She chose to reassure Jesus of her faith in him, of her confidence in him. And Jesus rewarded her faith and sent her on her way. And the child's uh, demon, the child's unclean spirit, was removed from the child. If we're talking about what it takes to see Jesus and the kind of faith that it takes to see and to encounter Jesus, the first thing I want us to notice uh, here in these stories of, of faith and encountering Jesus is seeing Jesus... Uh, for the Syrophoenician woman, it was about the importance of a persevering faith. A persevering faith. Her faith, you could say, persevered in this conversation. It would have been easy. It would have been so easy for her to take offense, and by her offense, to let that cloud her view of the Savior. But she let her persevering faith, her faith that wasn't going to be faltered or shaken just by some comment, she let that persevering faith allow her to clearly see who Jesus was, to persevere so that she could see the blessing and experience the blessing of who Jesus is. And if I'm thinking about us and, and, and our relationship with Jesus and us encountering Jesus in a way where we experience the blessings of of being in relationship with Jesus, of, of bearing the title of Christian. What does that mean for our faith? It does mean that our faith needs to have a certain kind of perseverance to it, an unshakability in our faith. We need that because there's a lot of things in this world and in our lives that are going to try to shake our faith, that are going to try to destroy our faith. Our faith needs to be something that can persevere through those things. And what is it that makes it able to persevere? Is it your fill in the blank? I was going to make a list, but I'm not going to make a list because it's not your fill in the blank, really. It's in the person of Jesus. If you have the knowledge of the person of Jesus... That's going to help you to be able to persevere through the storms, through the trials of this life, and through the things that choose to attack your faith, uh, is by relying on and trusting in the person of Jesus. The Syrophoenician woman, she looked to Jesus and she knew, she had full confidence that even a small bit of his power could bless her life. And she got to experience that because she persevered through this conversation. She persevered through the judgment that she experienced at the hands of Jesus' own disciples that were there. You get that in the telling of Matthew's account. And she persevered through the challenging statement that Jesus gave to her. Um, And this is something that can sometimes be, I, I I think it's beautifully depicted in this passage, but can sometimes be difficult for us to talk about of persevering even through our relationship with God, of persevering through our faith, of understanding that faith is going to be something that I struggle with. And that knowing in the midst of that struggle, if I can survive through the midst of that struggle, I'm going to come out on the other side of it even stronger. You see that here with the Syrophoenician woman. Our next story here that, that comes up in, in Mark chapter 7. Uh, we pick up here in Mark chapter 7, verses 31 through 34. Then he returned from the region of Tyre and went through Sidon to the Sea of Galilee. Uh, this is an interesting statement. Uh, the Sea of Galilee is south of Tyre. Uh, the city of Sidon is north of Tyre. So it says, from the region of Tyre, he went through Sidon to the Sea of Galilee. Jesus chose to go north in order to go south. It would kind of be like saying, uh, we, uh, I'm choosing to go, I'm, I'm going to Birmingham by way of Athens from Hartzell. Like that doesn't exactly make sense, but it's, you could do it. 
Uh, and that's what Jesus chose to do. He is ultimately going back to the Sea of Galilee, but he goes up through uh, towards Sidon, which for Jesus was about 25 miles from Tyre to Sidon. Uh, and, and within this one statement, then he returned from the region of Tyre and went through Sidon. The, the people that are uh, smarter than me, uh, these, these scholars who are more familiar with, with customs and timelines, estimate that from the time that Jesus originally left uh, the uh, region of the Sea of Galilee to going to Tyre and then Sidon and then back to the re uh, region of the Sea of Galilee uh, took about eight, it was probably an eight month journey. Uh, and it's recorded in, you know, six or seven verses here in Mark. An eighth month journey uh, that mo mostly we don't get many stories from. Many have speculated that this eighth month journey was a time for Jesus to really uh, impart his wisdom and his teaching upon the disciples and for them to really see how he operated. Because it's not long, it's, it's later on, uh, we'll look at it in two or three weeks, that Peter makes the bold confession that Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God. Um, and that's pretty quickly after they return back from, from this trip, this eight-month trip that they're on. But a lot of people speculate that this trip was a special time for Jesus and his disciples to be away from the pressure of the Jewish population and, uh, and the Jewish religious uh, establishment and to focus on creating the Christian movement. Anyways... Mark chapter 7, verse 31. Then he returned from the region of Tyre and went through Sidon to the Sea of Galilee in the region of the Decapolis. And they brought to him a man who was deaf and had a speech impediment, and they begged him to lay his hand on him. And taking him aside from the crowd privately, he put his fingers into his ears, and after spitting, touched his tongue, and looked up to heaven and sighed and said to him, Ephaphatha, that is, be opened. And his ears were opened, his tongue was released, and he spoke plainly. And Jesus charged them to tell no one, but the more he charged them, the more zealously they proclaimed it. And they were astonished beyond measure, saying, He has done all things well. He even makes the deaf hear, and the mute speaks. Now this interaction happens here back in the region of the Sea of Galilee, back within the territory of uh, where the majority population is probably Jewish. Um, but Jesus has this interaction of healing a deaf and a mute man and Jesus chooses to heal him first off privately second off he chooses to use him in a very physical way he puts his fingers in the ears of the deaf man he applies spit to the uh, mute man's tongue and through these things and upon the, uh, the statement of be open the man hears and the man is able to speak clearly. Why did Jesus choose to heal this way? I don't know. I, I, I don't know. J Jesus had healed people in many different ways. Jesus had healed people by laying hands on them. Jesus had healed people by being uh, not even in the immediate presence of the people that he was healing. Jesus had healed people who just came and touched Jesus. Uh, Jesus could have healed this person by any way that he chose to heal this person, and yet he chose, for whatever reason, to stick his fingers in the ears and to apply spit to the man's tongue. I don't know why Jesus chose the method that he did to heal this man, but I guarantee you there was a reason uh, that was obvious to the man who was healed or to those that were seeing it done. But the thing I want us to really take note of here. When it comes to seeing Jesus and what kind of faith it takes to see Jesus, for the deaf and mute man, we see the importance of a people of faith. The importance of a people of faith. If you notice in the, uh, in the passage in verse 32, and they brought to him a man who was deaf uh, and had a speech impediment. They brought him to Jesus. This, this man was, was brought to Jesus. And then when, when it was done and Jesus is speaking to those, this is in a private setting again, he speaks to a group of people. So this was a people of faith, a collection of people that, that wanted to bring this person to Jesus. If we want to be people who encounter Jesus, we need to be amongst people of faith. 
We need to be amongst people who, when we are in need, people say, let me take you to the feet of the Savior. Let me take you to the one who can heal you. Let me take you to the one who can help you. And I hope you have people like that in your life. That is the uh, blessing of what it means to be part of a congregation, a, a local congregation. Uh, all of us need to be part of a, of a local congregation, a local church family, where we have genuine and real relationships, not just where we see each other uh, a couple times a week, not just where we happen to sit in the same room and worship the same God at the same time, but where we have people in our lives who know the things that are going on in our lives, who are invested in the things that are going on in our lives, so that they can say, wow, you're going through this? Let me take you. Let me take you to the one who can heal you. It's so important to be amongst a people of faith. Uh, if we want to encounter Jesus, if we want to see Jesus, and not just uh, have a theoretical knowledge of who he is, but to actually experience what it means to be touched or healed by the Savior, a, a big part of that is doing that alongside other people of faith. Our third story this morning, as we go through these four stories in, in Mark, picks up here in Mark chapter 8. Mark chapter 8, starting in verse 1, it says, In those days, when again a great crowd had gathered, and they had nothing to eat, he called his disciples to him and said to them, I have compassion on the crowd because they have been with me now for three days and have nothing to eat. And if I send them away hungry to their homes, they will faint on the way, and some of them, and some of them have come from far away. And his disciples answered him, How can one feed these people with bread here in this desolate place? And he asked them, How many loaves do you have? They said, Seven. And he directed the crowd to sit down on the ground, and he took the seven loaves, and having given thanks, he broke them and gave them to his disciples and set before, and set before the people. And they set them before the crowd. And they had small fish, and they had a few small fish. And having blessed them, he said that these also should be set before them. And they ate and were satisfied. And they took up the broken pieces left over, seven baskets full. And there were about 4,000 people. And he sent them away. And immediately he got into the boat with his disciples and went to the district of Dominutha. Now this story is uh, the second feeding that Jesus does of a massive crowd. Uh, a few chapters ago, we looked at Jesus feeding the 5,000. Now we see Jesus feeding the 4,000. These are two separate stories, uh, not to be confused with, with one another. These are two separate stories. Um, and one of the differences that you notice in this story is these people that Jesus was choosing to feed had been with him for three days. We don't know the exact uh, nature of the three days that they had been with him, uh, but, but the idea is that probably Jesus had been teaching and maybe doing some healing with these people for three days, an extended period of time. So they had been laboring with Jesus uh, for quite a time and, uh, and learning from, from him uh, in, in here in this Jesus feeding the 4,000 located here in, in Mark chapter 8. So as we're thinking about seeing Jesus and encountering Jesus for the crowd that was fed, we see the importance of a patient faith. A patient faith. Chances are these people experienced some great things when they were in the presence of Jesus by Jesus teaching them. Maybe Jesus was even performing some miracles of healing them. But we see that as their interaction with Jesus went on from day to day to day, that ultimately at the end of this, they had something that was truly noteworthy, where Jesus multiplied food and fed 4,000 people. And why was that? Well, it was because that they chose to labor with Jesus for days on end. Uh, they chose to experience Jesus for days on end, and they received a blessing after they labored with Jesus for some time, And as I think about us, and, and we are people who we want to see Jesus, we want to experience the presence of what it is to be with Christ and to experience the blessings of what it is to be in relationship with Him, sometimes what that is going to mean is patience. Is patience. We might be people who 
walk with Jesus daily. We might be people who gather with God's people every time the doors are open and we have a genuine relationship with with God's people and we have a genuine and true and strong relationship with the Savior but maybe it's to a point to where you're in that relationship and you say I look at other people's relationships and I don't I don't see my faith being in the same place that their faith is I don't see blessings in my life like like other people maybe have experienced blessings you know maybe the 4,000 crowd there they had been with Jesus for days on end, and they were getting hungry, and they were thinking, you know what, we haven't, we haven't experienced the feeding that Jesus did like he did with that crowd of 5,000. But as they stayed with Jesus, as they labored with Jesus, as they were patient in what they were experiencing, eventually they did experience that blessing of this mass feeding because of Jesus' compassion on him. A lot of times we might not experience the blessings, the full blessings of what it means to be in relationship with Jesus. We might not experience those in the way that we expect to experience them daily. But the important thing is to keep laboring with the Savior. It's almost like if any of you, I don't know how many readers we have out there. Sometimes I get a book to read, and it sat before me, and it's a large book. And I look at it, and I think, I'm never going to get through that book because it's so big. And, and, and you can even kind of see it in your, in your Bible because Bible, you know, the pages of the Bible are, are very thin pages. And you, and you read a page, and you're like, man, that's a thin page. And it goes over, like, I, don't, I, I have not gained any. Man, that's, that's not very much. Then you read another page, like, oh, man, that was a, that was a lot of reading, and I haven't gotten that, that much yet. Well, it's a long game, isn't it? When you're reading a book, especially a, a large book, you're reading a book, it's about the collection of pages that you read. It's not about necessarily the singular page, but the collection of pages over time that gets you to the blessing of what it means to be invested in God's Word or in the book that you are reading. And it's the same way oftentimes in our walk with God. We, we, have, we have a day with the Lord, and we say, I've really labored with the Lord today, and we look back and we're like, man... Have I really gained that, that much from laboring with the Lord today? And the next day we choose, I'll, 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 do, I'll labor again. And we, and we labor with the Lord again, and we make decisions for the Lord again. We look back, like, have I really gained that much from laboring with the Lord today? And we do it for a month, and we look back, like, I, I mean, maybe, but have I really gained that much? But it's a collection, it's a journey, it's a walk with God over time. And before you know it, it adds up. And our patience in laboring daily eventually adds up to like, man, look where I was, and look where I'm at now. That's what it means to be a Christian, to be, to be perseverant and patient in our faith, to understand that this is... A marathon that each of us are running. We don't compare ourselves with other people in, in our faith. We just focus on, today I'm living for the Lord. Today I'm living for the Lord. Today I'm living for the Lord. This is very difficult, but I'm going to turn the page today. I am laboring with the Lord each and every day. I'm laboring with the Lord. And before you know it, you experience the blessings of what it means to patiently labor with the Lord. You do that, you see and you experience the Savior in ways that before you didn't know that you could. You have that in your life. So we see if we want to encounter Jesus, the importance of a persevering faith, the importance of being amongst a people of faith, and the importance of a patient faith. Lastly, we're going to look quickly at the last story here this morning. In Mark chapter 8, verses 11 through 13, Jesus is back amongst the Pharisees. Mark 8, starting in verse 11. The Pharisees came and began to argue with him, seeking from him a sign from heaven to test him. And he sighed deeply in his spirit and said, Why does this generation seek a sign? 
Truly I say to you, no sign will be given to this generation. And he left them, got into the boat again, and went to the other side. Now, had Jesus been doing signs? Yeah. He had been doing many, many miracles. The Syrophoenician woman, she came to Jesus without ever witnessing a miracle of Jesus. She had only heard about what Jesus had done. The deaf and mute man, the people that brought him to Jesus, they had probably never witnessed a miracle of Jesus, but by faith, by hearing the thing of, of who this person was, they brought him to Jesus, and their faith allowed him to be healed. The Pharisees and the scribes, they had heard about Jesus. They had heard about his miracles. They had heard about his teachings. And they go to him, and they ask for a sign. Why do they ask for a sign? Not because they have faith in him. They ask for a sign to test him. And Jesus sighs deeply. And speaking about the ruling government of the Jewish faith at the time, he says, this generation will never see a sign. They won't see it. They are in the presence of Jesus, and what are they doing? They are totally missing Jesus. They are totally missing God. The Pharisees could not see God right in front of him, but the people that we've seen here that are faith-filled, hopefully us, all of us as believers, the faith-filled followers see God in everything. 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 And a lot of times we don't get this in our early days of our faith journey, but as we go through this life, hopefully the idea is there that everything I experience in this life, I find the Savior. Everything I experience in this life, I find that God is in it and that God is working through it for the benefit of His kingdom. He's working through it all. I just have to have eyes to see it. I just have to have faith to see how Jesus is working. Let me give you a couple rapid-fire passages of God's presence in this world. Psalm chapter 139. Where shall I go from your spirit, or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to the heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take wings of the morning and dwell in the utmost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me and the light about me be night... Even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is bright as the day, for darkness is as light with you. He's, he's alluding to, no matter what I experience in this world, you are there, God. Even when I'm covered in darkness, even when I think I am totally lost, you see through all of that, and your presence is there. Colossians chapter 3, Paul is writing about work. Whatever you do, work heartily. Ask for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your, as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. All of us in our professions, in our work that we do daily, we should be able to find, you know what? The Lord is in my work. The Lord is in my profession. The Lord is working through, maybe it's me and my coworkers, or the Lord is working through my coworkers on me. The Lord is here and is working. James chapter 1, 17, every good gift, every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights. Everything you look at in your life, everything you look at that is good in your life, you say, wow, that's good, that's from God. Wow, this, this thing I have in my life, whether it's a person, an object, a material blessing, it's from God. God has allowed you to have that every good gift and perfect gift is from above. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 8 and 9, Paul is speaking about his thorn in the flesh, this trial, this difficulty that he has in his life. And he says, Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. All the things that are bad in your life, all the things that bring you pain in this life, you can find the Lord in it. You can find a way to say, this is, there is God in this. God is able and capable to work through this for the glory of his kingdom. The Pharisees, they wanted a sign so bad. For whatever reason, they, they, they wanted, or for, for the reason of, of not, not genuine faith, they wanted to see a sign, they wanted to see the Messiah, but they never saw the Messiah. They missed out on God in front of them. The faith-filled 
see God in everything. See God in everything. We're going to offer the invitation. This morning I'm asking you the question, do you see God in your life? Have you experienced the Savior in your life? Not just a head knowledge of, yes, there is a God, and yes, there is Jesus, but the real, Jesus has worked in my life. Jesus has transformed parts of me that I could not transform. Do you see God in your life? I, I hope that you do. Maybe this morning you, you hear about the goodness of who Jesus is, and you say, I want that in my life. I want to become a Christian. That opportunity is here for you this morning. If you want to become a Christian, we invite you to publicly uh, confess your faith, that you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, uh, that, that based off that confession, you choose to repent, to change your, your life, and to, and to live your life from less of self and more of God to being focused on Him to being immersed into the waters of baptism for the remission of your sin and rising out of that waters as a new creation, something new that you weren't able to create. If you want to become a Christian, that opportunity is here for you this morning. Or, or maybe you've done that, but you look at your life and you say, I know God, I know Jesus, but I feel a serious lacking in my life when it comes to how I experience Him in my faith. If that's you and, and, and you say, I need to make a change, make that change this morning. Maybe that change involves you coming and, and making some sort of public confession or some sort of public asking for forgiveness, or maybe that, that change involves you sitting right there where you're at right now and just closing your eyes and having a real genuine moment with the Lord where you're at right now. Make the change. Commit to turning the page today and tomorrow and the next day and see where it takes you. And if there's anywhere the church can help you uh, and you and your faith journey and what you have going on in your life, why don't you come as we stand and as we sing?